<laughs> so, hopefully this will work. Uh, so I've been writing for Wired for over a decade now. And let's see. These are some of the cover stories that I've written. Uh, in fact, that one in front, the next Steve Jobs, just came out in the US today. Uh, so you're the first in England to see it. Um, it it's interesting because I, I never intended to be a journalist. In fact, uh, I started out as an arm wrestler. <laughs> kind of a strange career path. Um, I, I was a data entry clerk in San Francisco. That's where I grew up. And it wasn't a very fulfilling life or job. And on a weekend, I saw a flyer for the US National Arm Wrestling Championship. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. I didn't really know, you know, over the top, of course. But I never knew it really still existed and that people took it seriously. And so I thought I'd go and check it out. And I arrived. This is in Laughlin, Nevada, which is in the middle of nowhere. It was in an Indian gaming casino. And when I walked into the casino, I went to the reception. I said, where's the US National Arm Wrestling Championship? And they said, we don't know. So I thought, well, geez, I just drove all the way out here to try to arm wrestle, and it's not there. And then I saw this really big guy kind of wandering back into the, the back end of the casino, and it turns out that the US National Arm Wrestling Championship was in a garden shed behind the casino. So I got in there, and I wasn't sure if I was going to wrestle. I just thought it would be interesting to observe, uh, and something different than my life typing numbers into a computer. Um, but the people there were really encouraging, and they said, look, it's open to anybody. It's, uh, you, know, you can get in. It's a double elimination event. Um, and so I thought I'd give it a try. And of course, you know, I hadn't really ever arm wrestled before. I'd arm wrestled my brother once, and I think he won. Uh, and so here I am at the Nationals, and one of the guys, Rick Salawada, who was a, a middleweight uh, champion, had gave me a few quick tips, which there is some strategy to it. It's quite interesting. Well, we, anybody want to arm wrestle? We can talk about it later. Uh, so I got up there, and I lose. No surprise, right? I lose twice, and I go in the kind of the end of the event. I'm sitting in the back drinking beers with some of the guys, and they start the awards ceremony with the lightweight division, which is what I'm in. And they say, first, you know, we're going to start with the awards. Fourth place in the United States, Joshua Davis, come on up here. <laughs> I'm like, what? You know, how, how is that possible? Uh, so I go up there, and they put a medal around my neck, and they said, congratulations, you're fourth out of four. <laughs> and there were only three other competitors in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the class. So, uh, but I was very excited. Uh, and I went home, and my wife was very happy and patted me on the back and said, good job. Uh, and a week later, I get a phone call from the president of the US National Arm Wrestling Federation to say, look, this is a little bit of a strange uh, situation we're in. We have to work our way down the, the list of nationally ranked arm wrestlers to fill out the American team for the world championship. And we get to take the top, we get to take two, the top two competitors. Number one can go, but number two uh, has various issues and can't leave the country. Uh, nor can number three. And so by our bylaws, we're forced to invite you to become part of Team USA. <laughs> so I'm like, what? Are you interested? Yes, I'm totally interested. I would love to do this. Uh, but it was also a big burden on me because now I'm representing my country and I've never won a match in my life. <laughs> so I, I realized this was a real chain, a turning point for me. Um, I got myself an arm warmer for this arm because I'd only qualified with my right arm. I had to stay in my weight class. Uh, and what that meant was I tried to get really big with this arm, lifting weights all the time, but doing nothing with this arm. So that I, my friends started calling me the crab because I had one big arm. <laughs> and uh, I flew out to Poland in the middle of winter, Gdynia, Poland, unfortunately. Uh, it was a very nice town, but just not in the winter. Uh, and I competed uh, as part of Team USA. Uh, and I ended up, amazingly, 17th in the world out of 18. Uh, and uh, the 18th guy didn't show up. So I've actually, I have still never won a competitive match, but uh, let's see if this will work. That's me, right there in the middle. But my arm's a lot bigger than, than it is now. Uh, but uh, what was amazing about the experience is that's me getting beaten. I lost twice in a row. Unfortunately, I got placed, uh, I, I went up against the Russian Ripper who was the Russian world champion, and he had a, um, 
he was famous for breaking people's arms. So I count it as a blessing that uh, I came out alive. Uh, so you, you wouldn't think that, that that would set you up for anything, but it turns out that I had a, a next door neighbor uh, who was an executive editor at Wired, and he said, that's a magazine story. I'm like, okay, well, how do you do that? He goes, well, you write up a short little thing, and you send it to people, and if they like it, they, they have you write it. And so my very first uh, feature, magazine, a feature magazine piece on National Magazine was about this experience uh, for Maxim, uh, where they titled it, How One Noodle-Armed Phoebe <laughs> <laughs> Attempted to Conquer the World of Arm Wrestling, which I didn't feel was quite the right <laughs> approach. Because I spent, I mean, what was interesting to me about it was it wasn't a stunt. I spent a year of my life, I mean, I just boiled it down, but I really, you know, I trained. I went to Houston, Texas to train with the world champion. Um, you know, I really took it seriously and, and gave it my best shot. Unfortunately, I still have never won a match. Uh, but it set me on this path of like, okay, you know, I felt like I kind of had to retire from arm wrestling. I wasn't going to do any better. <laughs> you know, that was like the top of my game. Uh, so then I, I ended up doing something called scajoring, which is like water skiing behind a horse <laughs> in the snow. And this is me at the, the, the national championship in Red Lodge, Montana. And it's really difficult. Uh, you can see the look on my face. <laughs> uh, the idea is you have an eighth of a mile track, and the horse is galloping. And it's everything you can do. It's all about rope control. Uh, and I actually ended up doing pretty well, because I realized that everybody else was trying to go super duper fast. And when that happens, the horse is going up. You're going off these giant jumps. And when you're in the air, you're going down the rope. And if you lose the rope, you're disqualified. So if you're DQ'd, you know, your, your standing goes way down. So in my, this is my first round where I got DQ'd because I let go of the rope. And the second one, I said, let's just go at a trot. Let's just go super slow. And we went very slowly around the track. And I ended up in the top 20 in the United States because a lot of people got DQ'd twice because they were gunning for it. Uh, so again, I never even wrote about this. This is the first time I've ever talked about it in front of an audience. <laughs> But you wouldn't, again, think that this would set you up in any way for a career uh, in anything other than scajoring, which the top prize was $10,000, so that's pretty good, actually. Uh, but I didn't get that. I didn't get any prize in that instance. But this was in 2003, and this was in the run-up when the tensions in the Middle East were really ratcheting up right before the invasion. And Wired, uh, at that point, uh, I knew people there because my next-door neighbor, and I went to them and said, look, you know, the war's coming up. Why don't you let me write a sidebar on your war coverage? Because uh, obviously it's the biggest event of the decade, and you've got plenty of people covering it. And they said, actually, we don't have anybody. So I was like, well, send me. Like, what are your qualifications? Well, I, I've scajored. <laughs> I'm a nationally, internationally ranked arm wrestler. And, but I think what it really came down to was they didn't have anybody else. So uh, I ended up in Iraq. Uh, <laughs> which, this is how I became a journalist, <laughs> uh, trying to figure out what the story is, what's going on here, you know, particularly for Wired, what's the tech angle? This was the first war uh, of the digital era. How does that differ from the way other wars were fought? And so I uh, attached myself to a, a bunch of different units that were the signal brigade, guys who wired the battlefield, uh, which was very fascinating and, and scary and... Um, uh, and I'm glad I, I, got, I got out you know, when I did. And I was there from the start of the war until right before Baghdad fell. Um, you know, but even when I came back, Wired uh, was saying, OK, you've proven that you can write, I guess, from these kind of situations. And, and that's when I became a contributing editor to the magazine, was 03. But I still couldn't kind of shake the other stories that I was always interested in, and, and that's when I discovered sumo wrestling. <laughs> so, so uh, again, I spent the next year, I got back from Iraq, and I spent a year sumo wrestling. And, the, and I, I guess what I was going for was to try to prove that I could. I, and maybe that's what's happening a lot in my life. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I just don't see why I can't get in the ring, why I shouldn't give it a try. This is me as part of the U.S. sumo demonstration team in front of uh, the, the White House, or down the street from the White House. Uh, and I actually won this match. This is me against Big T. Uh, he was going at about 20%, so he was definitely taking it easy on me. 
Uh, but this was in the run-up to the US Sumo Open, where I became the lightest man to ever sumo. Uh, and I went up against Marcus Barber, who is uh, 485 pounds and uh, an opera singer, uh, very talented. And uh, so my attitude to this was, OK, maybe there's a smart way. Maybe, the, you know, uh, maybe there's a way of approaching this that, that s smaller people haven't quite figured out yet, and that maybe we can compete in the ring. And the idea here is you have a 485-pound guy, but his leg is not 485 pounds, right? So his leg is probably more my size. So the idea was I'm going to attack that leg, and I'm going to get this guy up on his leg. And now you've got a 485-pound guy on one leg. That's a very different proposition. So I get in there, and I get that leg. And the problem is that now I'm totally within his range. And he grabs my diaper, which is called a mawashi. And he yanks it up, the biggest wedgie of my life, puts me on his belly, and walks me out of the ring. Uh, and, and it was really humi humiliating, hum humiliating. Patted me. I mean, he was nice. He said, good job. You tried. Uh, and after the event, I'm kind of licking my wounds in the corner, and I'm feeling, OK, this is stupid. You know, Why did I think I could even try? And this father uh, comes up to me with his young son, who's maybe six or seven years old. And the son's very shy, and is kind of hanging back. And the dad says, go ahead, go ahead. And the son can't act. Does, is too shy to talk to me. And the dad says, well, my son wanted to meet you because uh, he gets beat up on the playground a lot by kids who are a lot bigger than him. And seeing you in the ring uh, just made him feel better. It made him feel like he may not win, but at least he can fight. And then the kid came up and gave me the program for the event and asked for my autograph. And I realized then that it was maybe there's something about the underdog and, and just putting yourself out there and continuing to try. Uh, and so I've spent a lot of my career writing about underdogs. Uh, I wrote this story uh, soon after I sumo wrestled about a group of uh, kids in East Phoenix who were undocumented immigrants. They'd spent their whole life in the US, but they were born in Mexico. And so they were in this weird kind of gray zone in the US. And they built an underwater robot that went on to win the US National Underwater Robotics Championship up against MIT, which was sponsored by Exxon Mobil. Uh, and these four kids beat the best college teams as high schoolers. Uh, and that blew me away. And, uh, and this kind of underdog mentality that there's no reason why you shouldn't get in the pool. There's no reason why you shouldn't try. Um, and what's also interesting about this, and this is how my thinking as a storyteller has started to evolve, is uh, the film version of this just started filming this week in New Mexico. Um, with George Lopez and uh, Jamie Lee Curtis and a bunch of young uh, up-and-coming actors. Uh, and so this idea that stories can live in different mediums, that the story that I told in the magazine can have a similar existence uh, in film, uh, started to broaden my horizons. Uh, another person who broadened my horizons is John. Uh, I don't know if you're, how much it was covered here in the UK, but uh, I spent a good deal of last year living with John, um, weeks with him in Belize, um, months and months talking on the phone. And John's whole perspective and the reason I was in Belize with him was he was trying to convince me that the Belizean government was trying to kill him, uh, was, had a vendetta against him, that he was a, a, an anti-corruption crusader. Uh, and when I went and tried to investigate those things, I, I, I didn't find that. I found something very different. I found that people were quite scared of, of him. And so when I came back to his island uh, compound to confront him and, and basically lay it all out, say, this is the, the result of my months and months of research into your life, uh, he got very upset. And he had a gun strapped to his chest, and he pulled it out. And there, it was a Smith & Wesson with five chambers. He drops the bullets out on the ground. He picks one bullet up, chambers it. And I said, John, you know, no. <laughs> we, I don't know what you're doing, but let's not do it. <laughs> and he closes the chamber, spins it, puts the gun to his head. And he says, this is a gun, right? I'm like, yes. He goes, there's a bullet in there. I go, yeah, John, I saw that. And he had his, one of his girlfriends was sitting right next to him. And so I'm worried about him, but I'm also worried about her, because if the bullet goes off, it's going to go through his head into her. And I'm sitting right next to him here. And he starts pulling the trigger. There's five chambers. He 
click. He goes, what you think is reality, click. May not, click. I think I'm at three. <laughs> B, click, we're four clicks. And he pulls it one more time. Click, reality. You are operating on an assumption. Click, 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 click. And I can see the hammer moving. I can see the bullet rotating. You are operating on an assumption of reality that's wrong. And I say, OK, put the gun down. It's a trick. Fine. You know, great. I get your point. And he goes, oh, you think this is a trick? <laughs> and shoots the bullet outside into the sand right next, right next to me. And that's when I realized that I needed to leave Belize. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which I, I did, uh, but nonetheless, it also made me realize that, that, okay, I got home and I started to kind of reconsider maybe my assumptions about reality, maybe the assumptions that I have about my own career are wrong, maybe my stories don't just have to be magazine stories. Uh, I have an old friend of mine who wrote the Wired article that became Argo, got turned into the, the movie Argo and won Best Picture, uh, and him and I are very interested, we're, we're, we kind of are interested in the same types of stories, these um, really dramatic true stories that seem to be all over the place. Uh, and so we decided that we would form our own venture, uh, our own digital magazine called Epic. And the idea is that we can go out uh, and travel around the world and the national magazines, uh, most magazines have a limited amount of space for really long in-depth stories. You know, every magazine will, you know, maybe they have a how-to, they have a profile, uh, and maybe they have one long story. That's all I really like. I, only lo that's I just want to travel the world, find these long stories, and publish them. And so this is a venture and a venue for just that type of thing. Uh, the other interesting thing that we came to is we find these stories, like The Mercenaries, the first one that came out, Deep Sea Cowboys, a story about guys who save sinking ships. Each of these stories can live not just as long-form narrative pieces, but they can also live as films. They can live as blog posts. They can live as podcasts. And so part of the idea with Epic is that we will have an entire kind of world surrounding one story. So you have a story about a guy who's a mercenary and goes and tries to solve a high altitude gold heist in the Peruvian Andes. You can have blog posts about that. You can have the one long story. You can have videos that talk about the guy's history. Um, the idea is each of those can also have their own income streams, all of which feeds into the central idea of being able to send journalists out into the world in order to chase these stories because it's not that easy and it's expensive and you have to go somewhere for six months and really dig in and go live with somebody. And they're wonderful things. How do you support that going forward into the 21st century? This is a shot at trying to do that. So thank you very much.